Um, so I'm Patrick Wolf, uh, Director of Product Management at CloudBees. And uh, I'm James Dumay, Senior Product Manager at CloudBees. And we want to talk today about all the investment we're making into Jenkins in the open source side, um, why that's important, and um, just how we're doing that investment um, for the future and going forward with that. Um, so hopefully we'll be fairly brief today and take questions on that as well. Um, and we've kind of structured it in this way. Um, to answer who we are, why we are investing in Jenkins, what we're investing in, and, and how we go about doing that. No, let me in first. So as I said, I'm Patrick Wolf, direct product director here. I've been part of CloudBees for about 18 months now. It feels like a lot longer. Um, it is a fast-growing company. We've been um, around for more than a few years. But uh, we made a, a pivot um, probably about two years ago towards doing everything about Jenkins. And we've bet everything on Jenkins right now for, for the way forward with that. And uh, I, so I'm, I'm James, yet again. Yeah, again. <laughs> um, I've been product, product manager at CloudBees for a year now, uh, working on Blue Ocean, which you've probably seen uh, on the floor and uh, at the talk yesterday and at the keynote. Uh, it's been a bit of, bit of that going on. Um, really excited to be here. Uh, previously, uh, I was at a startup for about 15 months called Canva, based out of Sydney in Australia. Uh, we built a uh, really great online design tool, so if you do a little bit of social media or marketing or, you know, business cards or that kind of thing, uh, you can design that in the browser. And I had a really great time there um, learning from some of the best uh, design people in Australia. And prior to that, uh, I was a product manager at Atlassian for Bamboo, if you're familiar with that tool. Uh, now I'm working on Jenkins, a uh, <laughs> bit of a pattern. Uh, and I was there for seven years, um, uh, kind of there through um, Atlassian's formative years. So it's really exciting to be back uh, at CloudBees and back devel um, developing uh, developer tools and, and building great stuff for you guys. So. so hopefully everyone recognizes this uh, this picture, uh, or at least this person. Um, this is Kosuke Kawaguchi. He's the, the creator of Jenkins, um, originally Hudson. Um, and he's been part of CloudBees for several years now um, as our CTO and a very important part of Jenkins and still actively contributing to the project. Uh, but he's not the only one at CloudBees, and, and we want to make that clear that there's a huge number of people that are actually contributing code back to that. So between, uh, between Patrick and my team, um, I, don't, I can't even remember how many people we've got. We've got <laughs> so many people working on Jenkins at CloudBees, um, and uh, here's a selection of um, some of them that have made um, great contributions already to, um, to Jenkins project and to also CloudBees. Um, so I just, uh, I just kind of wanted to put them up here and thank them for their efforts. Um, many of them couldn't be here today to uh, talk to you about Jenkins and um, the way that you use it, but um, I'm sure they're um, happy to know that uh, they're appreciated. So. Yeah, and these aren't the only people working on CloudBees. These are just people specifically contributing back to Jenkins, either the core or plugins or something around the open source project. Um, and quite a few people who are doing nothing but community work, so someone like Daniel Beck or... Um, Tyler Croy um, and Liam Newman, who who work specifically within the community. So, you might be wondering what the relationship is uh, that Clavis has to Jenkins, and one thing we want to kind of make we want to make clear here is that Jenkins is open source. Um, open source is in the DNA of CloudBees, um, and we hope that uh, our contributions there. Uh, we're acting as good good participants and stewards of the project. Um, and uh, Patrick and myself and the rest of the, the open source team at CloudBees are the voice of the CloudBees, uh, of the Jenkins community uh, within the sort of business side of CloudBees. So um, when it comes to open sourcing new features that may have been developed at CloudBees, uh, we're sort of the ones that are advocating for those, uh, for those things. Um, and we try to balance the interest of the community and CloudBees as much as possible. Um, and that can be a very challenging thing to do. Uh, most product managers uh, have to spend, you know, when they're, they're building their roadmaps and their backlogs, um, they only have uh, their development teams and, and their kind of uh, upper management to answer to. Um, we have all of you guys to answer to. So uh, it's, 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 an interesting, it's, it's an interesting experience sometimes and um, a bit removed from the norm of regular product management, but it's very enjoyable. 
Yeah, and to balance that out on the other side, as I mentioned, we've got Kosuke, Tyler, Liam, and, and Daniel Beck, who um, are the, the voice of the community back towards us, and, and their entire focus is on um, the community side of Jenkins um, within CloudBees as well. Yeah. So between all of us, we represent Yeah. And it's really, it's really important to also recognize the cloud, uh, that the evangelists that are hired by CloudBees, while they are on the payroll, they, they do speak for the community and probably, pro the, and, and almost the community alone in, in that respect. So it's, it's great that we can enable them um, to be there as representatives um, of the community and to get the message out about Jenkins um, around the world. So now a little bit about why the investment. Hopefully it's obvious for everyone why we're investing as much as we are in Jenkins. Um, but just to, 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 to state it fully, um, you know, CloudBees doesn't exist without Jenkins at this point. Our entire product line and everything that we do is based on Jenkins and having a strong, viable Jenkins. Um, and with that, um, all of our customers, the, the success of our customers is contingent upon Jenkins being world class and the, the best possible product it can be. So with that, we, we, it's, everything we do is with the goal of making Jenkins um, the best possible product in the open source it can be and make it ubiquitous across the world um, and then add value on top of that that we actually provide with CJP and um, PSE and all the other product line we have that. But the baseline, the kernel of that has to be um, a hardcore Jenkins for everything we do. Yeah. And because we have so many community people from the community um, who have been hired at CloudBees, cloud, in, in a certain way, a healthy community is a healthier CloudBees, and a healthier CloudBees is a healthier community. And um, so it's, it's really great that um, sometimes you forget you're working in a company. <laughs> <laughs> so the ultimate goal is world domination, obviously, for <laughs> Jenkins and for CloudBees. But it starts with Jenkins for that to happen. So that's the, the first step for everything. Um, and I don't know if you want to talk to this slide, but so one of the great things about working on Jenkins um, is it's just how pervasive it is. Um, so you might be familiar with uh, uh, HBO Silicon Valley. Um, what? Oh, slide. Oh, go ahead. Um, Jenkins is like turned up in all sorts of places, like this TV show. You know, as they're launching, I think Pied Piper, um, and it's just. It's just amazing to see, that, you know, when you, you go out to communities or you, you watch TV, you're just chilling out at home, and to have Jenkins guy in a pop into your life like that. Um, so it's just astounding. And if you talk to Kosuke at all, ask him about this. He's extremely proud of this moment because he actually showed his family and everyone that, hey, this is what I do, and it's on mainstream TV. So this is an extremely uh, great topic to talk with Kosuke about. He loves this. So now um, we want to talk a little about what our investments are. A lot of this is going to be duplicate of some of the keynote and some of what James has talked about, and there's multiple presentations about that. But we kind of wanted to group that together under um, kind of a lead-in for some of the other stuff. But this is kind of what we're investing in going oh, forward. And if you do have any questions, just please raise your hand. We'll be happy to answer them. And please speak up, because I'm mostly deaf, so. I'll make sure I'll repeat the question. <laughs> so... Um, you know, last year, about what well, it was last year, we celebrated 10 years of Jenkins, um, and it's been out there for 10 years. So the big step now is, okay, we've been 10 years in the market. It's, it's, a, it's a mature product. How do we make sure that Jenkins is ready for the next 10 years? And that's what we're looking towards is really investing in the future of this and moving this forward for the next 10 years of Jenkins. Um, and with that, we released Jenkins 2.0 earlier this year. Um, You've seen some of the adoption graphs. They talked about this in the keynote. How many people here are on Jenkins 2.0 right now? Hands. That's good. Oh, wow, That's quite most of everyone. Fantastic. And, uh, if you haven't noticed as well, we just released uh, CJP on 2.0 um, just last week as well. So now the entire product line is up to date on 2.0. So all of the features and, and um, the last things we've been adding in to, to Jenkins in, in, the, in yeah, the last several months have been incorporated into CJP. I believe the, the current LTS is 2.7.9. Um, so it's a, um, is that right? Yeah. yeah. I have to look it up, sorry. 
But uh, with that, so with that kind of release for Jenkins 2.0, it had been a long time coming, um, about 10 years in the making to finally do that. And we wanted to push 2.0 to be kind of a, a pivot point between um, old school freestyle um, CI jobs and the future with um, containers, continuous delivery, a new user experience, as well as, as moving towards scalability as well. I, but I think you can kind of sum up the, the investments that we're, we've ha we had made in Jenkins 2 and continuing into next year is that it's all about a Jenkins pipeline. And we really believe that pipeline is going to become the way for users with, at all levels of expertise that are going to automate um, you know, continuous delivery and all, all sorts of automation within their companies and, and, and projects um, in Jenkins. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and just to, to add on that, so, so everything we want to look at is pipeline because pipeline has the durability. It, 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 if we survive Jenkins restarts, it will serialize everything to pick that up again. With CJP, we have the checkpoint feature that you can actually restart from a stalled or a paused um, pipeline to keep that going again. Um, and it's a much more flexible way to create jobs. Freestyle was very contained within a configuration UI. It could do one stage of a pipeline. It was very um, linear in the way things had to be done. And to be able to construct a real CD pipeline with Freestyle, you had to have multiple jobs strung together with one thing or another orchestrating all those jobs. Pipeline itself becomes the place to have these long-running builds and everything um, configured together. So with that, hopefully everyone's, has, has anyone used Pipeline, anyone not used Pipeline? Is everyone using Pipeline here? Yes. Yeah, about That's half, good. so. If you haven't yet, we really, really encourage you to start. I mean, there are huge advantages, and we are going to make it. Um, with that, one of the big things that we're trying to do now in, in between James and me and a lot of the things we're releasing here at Jenkins World um, are about making Pipeline very easy to adopt. Um, we don't want a bunch of everybody writing their own snowflake scripts um, that are out there that are very hardcore groovy, that are um, not easy to maintain because it's not well written. Uh, we want a little bit more structure and a little bit, uh, a lot shorter learning curve up towards that. And there are also some advantages to switching to pipeline uh, from other job types. Um, it, I know many of you are development managers or people kind of responsible for the direction of, um, <coughs> of development tools or continuous delivery at your own companies. And I think really um, Pipeline is a great opportunity to get your whole organization standardized on the one way to use Jenkins. And that's going to save you a, a, lot, of, a lot of time. There's, there's, no, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of plug-in compatibility with Pipeline, but the way that you'll be building... Uh, automation within your organization is going to be standardized. And I think as well, when you're onboarding new people, um, that just helps so much. Uh, you know, that helps a lot with the education pro process because it's within your organization. It's not, you know, here's a Jenkins server. Here's another completely differently configured Jenkins server in a different way of doing things. You have one standard way of doing it and really good tooling to, to, to you know, onboard people. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. So... One of the things that we released, and actually Andrew Bayer is speaking about this um, in the next session, um, next hour. So I, if you want to know more about this, please go to the session. I can answer questions on it, but uh, I would encourage you to go see Andrew's session as well. And Andrew dem demonstrated this at lunch uh, time as well, is, is what we're calling declarative pipeline syntax. It's part of pipeline. It's a new plugin. It's available now um, for download. Um, and it's... An HCL format's more like Terraform, but it's also uh, very similar to the Groovy pipeline. But it is a declarative syntax. It's not a, a, a scripting syntax. So you're not declaring variables. You're not doing for loops. You're not doing if else. It's very much straightforward declaring my stages. I'm declaring my notifications. Um, if you notice the um, you can s declare an agent, which is going to be your build node, and that's going to be consistent throughout all of your different stages. And that can be a Docker image. It can be a, um, a, a, a permanent yeah. agent out there. Um, and some of the big advantages of this is it's a defined model. It's a very consistent defined model, which means that it's very easy to write a, a UI for. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, it also allows us, because it has that defined model, to do pre-compilation -com syntax checking, and it's available for linting as well. So before it runs, we can tell you if there's a problem with the pipeline instead of having to do compilation, start the run, and then you get a stack trace error in the middle of the pipeline. Um, now we can do that all up front. 
Um, the other big advantage is that it's sandbox compliant. Um, I don't know if has anyone run into sandbox issues before with the whitelist for, for pipeline. Um, and that's because um, Kosuke wrote in a runtime sandbox for Groovy to make sure that security vulnerabilities weren't going to be introduced by people writing code for Jenkins. So it runs within a sandbox. And you'll get this sandbox security, script security acceptance um, to make sure that people aren't going to ruin your Jenkins by running something they shouldn't be. So anything within the declarative syntax is automatically um, accepted by that whitelist because people can't go beyond what the whitelist or what the declarative syntax allows them to do. It's just very easy to learn. And to give you a bit of a, 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 a view behind, you know, behind the curtain, uh, you know, at CloudBees, the, the reason why this CloudBees has funded this and this uh, came about was that we really heard the, commu the, the, the feedback from users about um, you know, some of the issues that they were having um, you know, building their pipelines. And we, re we recognized in that feedback that not, not, um, there was a, a large portion of the user base that didn't want to script their pipelines. They wanted to configure their pipelines. And there was a big difference. And so this really came about by listening to the community, um, that information coming back to the product team and for us formulating a plan to, to, to fix that problem. And so that's just an example of the kind of things that we try to do at CloudBees to, to, to help you know, shepherd things in the community along in the right direction. Yeah, and one, one of the other things too, and then to, to segue into the next slide, is that because it's part of pipeline, we're not taking away pipeline. Everything in pipeline is still available. You can write in the DSL if you want to. Um, this is a different syntax to write those pipelines. Um, but anything that's created for pipeline, because pipeline is extensible, automatically becomes available as a step within the declarative syntax. So if I create a new step in a plugin, that's automatically available within the declarative syntax as well. And so one of the other things that Jesse presented on earlier this week, Jesse Glick, who's one of the main programmers and actually probably the primary contributor for everything in Pipeline and kind of almost half of Jenkins as well, but um, is uh, he, he presented on shared libraries. So before we had what was called the global library, which was stored within the internal Git for Jenkins. What we've done now is we've, we've extended that, and it's a superset. You can actually have those shared libraries outside of Jenkins within a Git, within GitHub, within SVN, within your Bitbucket, any external Git library, subversion library. You can have shared libraries, and those can be available at the Jenkins master level, at the folder level, um, or at the actual Jenkins file level. So you can actually implicitly load those directly in a Jenkins file um, and have those available. And if you combine the two, where you create global variables or these class files on the back end and steps within these shared libraries, they're automatically available within the declarative syntax. So it's a very good way to separate the functions between the experts who are writing the steps and all of the, the business logic and everything behind it, and the end user who only has to know what that step is called and what parameters they want to pass to it. Um, so you can actually keep the, the, the newbies and the end users um, that the, the domain knowledge they have is what their tasks are focused on, and the Jenkins people can focus on Jenkins. Yeah, so a great example of that is if you say um, you, you, across your, your company you had a, a standard security check that you wanted to run or a static analysis step, and that was something that was involved. Maybe you have to take a binary, upload, the, uh, upload that to um, a security scanning service or whatever, a static analysis service, whatever it might be, and it kind of gets a bit complicated. Um, it means that you can create a, a step that you put in your global library and then just tell your users what that step's called and then they can declare it in the declarative pipeline. So it really just solves some of the usability pain points when, when uh, approaching pipeline and rolling that out to multiple teams. So that's great. Yeah, and this makes it much more dry. And I, I did mention before, but it is versioned as well. So you can actually specify a specific tag, um, check checksum, or ta uh, branch of your Git repository or your subversion repository to pull that library in. So if you want to experiment and have a certain set of libraries and play around with something, your, your, your core set that your users are using won't change until you're ready to roll that over um, to the next version for that. Um, so I don't know how many of you were at the Blue Ocean talk, but um, Blue Ocean's the new user interface that we've been building for Jenkins over the last year. Um, it, we're really designing it to make it extremely pleasant to work with Jenkins Pipeline, uh, first and foremostly. It does work with other job types, but all of the new bells and whistles um, are really trying to take advantage of Pipeline. So you may have seen the, the, the visualization 
um, and a couple of the other uh, the nice features in BlueOcean, um, all made possible by the, the power of pipeline. Um, and one of my gr favorite features in BlueOcean is the personalization feature where you can kind of make Jenkins your own uh, with a little favoriting system. If you push a branch, it'll get favorited, that sort of thing. Um, and so this is really great for people of multiple roles within the organization to kind of create their own view of Jenkins and what, what, what's, what they're interested in and what's meaningful to them. Um, so if you missed the news, uh, we released the beta, um, the first beta of Blue Ocean uh, yesterday. It's available today in the update center. Um, I would encourage you to try it out. Um, we're calling it beta because we're not finished uh, necessarily with the features that we want to deliver to call it a whole brand new experience for developers. Um, but it is at a, a point where it's usable and we're looking forward to your feedback. And we're actually opening up um, some room in our roadmap to incorporate um, that feedback that you'll give to us over the next couple of months. Yeah, so. one thing I, I would note on that, for uh, uh, because it is um, a, a a wholly separate UI, and it's a plugin. Um, you can use it in conjunction with your current running Jenkins without having to replace anything. It doesn't take anything away. That's right. Um, it's it's a total addition. It's not a zero sum mm -hmm. game here. Yeah. So if if something doesn't work in Blue Ocean, you can just switch back to Classic. Or if there's information not available, Classic is always there for you. Um, and this this is uh, I think pro it, I have lots of favorite features. Every feature is my favorite. Uh, but this is the pipeline editor. So what we really want to do is make it uh, the simplest way for anyone wanting to get started with pipelines uh, in Jenkins, and we want to make it visual. Um, so I can imagine you sitting around the table with you know, your lead developer, your operations manager, and maybe you know, your CTO, and kind of figuring out together like how you're going to deliver the value to your customers um, using, using a pipeline. So what's really great here is that if you want to add sequential stages to um, this pipeline, I would just click on the, the, blue, uh, the blue cross furthest to the, to the right, and that would create another, another stage. Or if I wanted to run things in parallel and get a speed up, I would just click on the ones uh, on, on that point towards the bottom of the page. Um, and because this is using pipeline under the hood, um, any plugin that has pipeline uh, support in it will automatically appear in a dialog when you click add step and you can just search for the, the, the step that you're interested in, configure it, and then hit save, and away you go. And the, the goal is that this is going to create the declarative syntax into the Jenkins file, so when it does get put there, it will be a simplified, human-readable file within the Jenkins file that uses all of the other steps and libraries that have been created for that purpose. So it's not going to be something that's um, all these different weird formatting that only is machine readable or anything. It is going to go into a human readable, editable format. And as long as it's within that declarative syntax, um, it should be bi directional as well. Yeah. And this is an another example of where we heard the community and the feedback from, from you guys um, about uh, you know, people wanting to create those pipelines in different ways, right? So we have people who uh, are more comfortable using a user interface to create those pipelines. We have people who may want to use the configuration variant of pipeline, uh, the declarative um, uh, way of using pipeline and the scripting um, way of using pipeline. And the great thing about uh, the, using the editor and declarative in, uh, in tandem together is that you, it kind of balances the needs between the people who like the script and the people who like to code. So any uh, declarative pipeline that you create can be read by the editor, and any uh, you know, pipeline you create uh, in the editor is then a declarative file. So when you hit save, it's actually committing that back to your repository. Yes, sir? That's a, that's a good question. So what is the process of getting the pipeline into your SEM? So what, the one thing that we haven't shown uh, at Jenkins World is uh, some designs on a, what we call the creation flow. So if you can imagine unpacking a brand new Jenkins instance with Blue Ocean installed on it, you'd click New Pipeline, and it would ask you, where is your source code stored? So you'd get options like you know GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, whatever that might be, plain old Git. Um, and you click on one of those, it would list out the repositories, say if we pick GitHub, list out your repositories on GitHub, and you click <coughs> on one of those. If one of those has a Jenkins file already, we'll just launch into running your pipeline. If it doesn't have one, we'll launch you into the editor. 
Does that answer your question? No problem. So the ultimate goal of this with between um, all of these changes to pipeline is we, pipeline is already much more powerful than anything you can possibly do with freestyle jobs. The, the, the end goal of this is to make it easier to create pipeline jobs than it is to create freestyle. Um, so, you know, eventually pipeline will be the de facto standard. Every job will be in pipeline. Um, and we are also looking at ways to just do freestyle job converter to convert those into pipeline as well. It, it was the question to say that the Jenkins file would name the plugin and it would download the plugin. So right now we've had a lot of discussion about that. We want we we do have a an RFE out in Jenkins. I don't um, um, to actually include a section to name the plugins that are used for the pipeline or for your Jenkins file, um, but. The, there's, there's security risk in having that download and install plugins on its own. So what it would probably do is we're, we're more looking at being able to declare what plugins are needed or what plugins were available at the time of the last run. So you can actually look at that and say, I need these plugins. And the administrator would then make the choice of do I need to install these plugins or not um, for that. Just because, you know, there is a huge risk in just letting somebody change your, uh, your master. <coughs> But that's a great question. Oh, my connection's lost. Oh, I'll, I'll progress the slide. So did anybody not, did everybody see the keynote? Um, so during the keynote when Sasha was there, um, our, our CEO, they did a, a demonstration of uh, the, the private SaaS edition for CJP. And this is actually running live of 2,000 masters uh, within Amazon Web Service on PSC, all running in, in containers. Um, we think it's the largest cluster of Jenkins ever created. Um, don't know that for sure, but um, it's definitely something our IT noticed it um, with running up there for that. Um, but <coughs> you know, one of the, the biggest goals we have in open source um, is to get to that level of scalability within open source Jenkins as well. Um, the management is still going to be a, a pain within open source, but there should be no reason why we can't scale to a huge number of jobs across everything within Jenkins as well. Um, and Google has shown some really good examples of that in their talk. Uh, I don't know if everyone saw Google's talk, but they're talking about how to scale up Jenkins as well, and they're actually starting to look at how they can contribute that I, back. I believe Google's talk is at 4 p.m. Oh, is it later yeah. today? Mm -hmm. Everybody's after us today. Yeah, it's, I think it's in the last, uh, the, the last set of talks. Okay. Yeah. So if you go to the next slide, the, um, <clears throat> with that, one of our main developers, Stephen Connolly, who's been involved with Jenkins for quite a few years now, is presenting later today on um, his, um, the largest Jenkins install ever um, of, I think, several thousand build agents. Um, I forget how many, but he's going to do it all in his presentation. Um, and he gives a lot of advice on how to scale Jenkins itself uh, with the number of executors and the number of executors that you should be targeting and the resource usage for that um, and just how to scale your Jenkins um, as well as possible. And with that, he's actually releasing a new um, plugin called the Chaos Butler, modeled after the Chaos Monkey from... Netflix that will actually go in and start removing jobs from Jenkins, turning down nodes, and doing things that um, would cause chaos in your Jenkins installation to help you build resiliency within Jenkins itself um, for that. And that's available now, but uh, it, it will shut down your nodes and stuff like that. So make sure that you're using it wisely. But it, it can be a great tool for installing into your Jenkins installation. Do you want to talk about that? So um, last year when we, uh, at Juice uh, West, we had a huge push for everything Docker. Um, and all of that that we've done with, with Docker, with Kubernetes, with Mesos, um, all of these cloud native technologies has all been open sourced. Um, it's been open sourced since uh, I think we released most of that. And there are quite a few Docker plugins. Um, there's a, the Kubernetes plugin, and Carlos is actually speaking about that right now. Um, in another room. Uh, and all of these things are meant to help scale the infrastructure of Jenkins. 
Um, when you can actually spin up a build agent within Jenkins in a quick Docker container, and you can keep doing that over and over again on different things, you actually achieve great, greater scale than having permanent agents that are just bare metal or virtual machines or anything. Um, that, so the number of tasks you can run um, dramatically increases with that. Yeah. The, the Docker support in Jenkins is incredibly important to us because what it allows, I, I guess we live in, uh, we're in, a, we're in a great time in the technology industry that we have all of these amazing tools available to us that are solving problems that were extremely difficult to solve even you know just a couple of years ago. And I would like to call Docker out as a, one of these key technologies that we're thinking about um, at the moment on how and on how it's going to actually help Jenkins users. So you remember we had the de decorative uh, pipeline example there. Um, one of the great things that we're adding, uh, new features that we're adding to declarative pipeline is the ability to put a Docker file in the same repository as your Jenkins file and just have the declarative pipeline build that Docker image and then run your pipeline within it. So that means that the build environment, the definition of the pipeline and your software all versioned together which is, is just a phenomenal combination, uh, combination. There's like no more. All you have to do on your Jenkins inf infrastructure is make sure you have you know, Linux installed and Docker and away you go, right? It doesn't um, have to be Linux anymore. You can do Windows now. And you can do Windows now. I mean, Microsoft have made a huge commitment uh, uh, to Docker and, and also a huge commitment recently to the Jenkins project and um, um, provided, provided us some sponsorship in the form of uh, um, some uh, uh, resources on uh, Azure. So. Um, the last piece on scalability is um, Kosuke also mentioned in his keynote address that um, one of the big projects for the next, um, hopefully, six months to a year, um, depending on you know how much we release at given any given time, is the concept of storage pluggability. Um, if you've used Jenkins, you know that Jenkins requires a local file mount, whether it's NFS or whatever the mount point is, to be able to run. So we want to be able to take that away, um, that restriction, so you can actually have it store um, the console logs, the build artifacts, the, um, the build logs, everything that Jenkins creates, um, the config XMLs, all of that gets stored um, wherever you specify. It would be in another extension point that you can actually, um, someone would write a plug-in to actually be able to store it on S3, to store it on Azure Store, mm -hmm. to store it in a database um, or anything like that and actually persist that somewhere other than just the file system. Um, and this opens up the door to a huge amount of other things like Kosuke's example is that you can store your build logs forever. Um, I'm just thinking about other ways of using um, containers. It makes it easier to run the Jenkins in a container without the need for a local file mount. And if you think about your, if you think about Jenkins availability, um, I don't know how many of you sort of have like a backup plan for you know what happens when your Jenkins master goes down. But you know it's a little clunky at the moment. You, you know your Jenkins go, Jenkins goes down. It's been writing its config to an NFS share, uh, NFS share. And then you bring up another Jenkins somewhere else, and you know sometimes there's some problems with synchronizing all those files and not persisting, um, you know, persisting things properly if it's come down uncleanly. Um, but now you can kind of think about it that Jenkins doesn't even touch the Jenkins master doesn't even touch the file system; it can just touch the database, just like any other web app. Um, and so there's some really great things that we can do there as in, in so far as scalability. We can start thinking about ways of horizontally scaling Jenkins. Um, you know, ac across multiple nodes, and if one of those nodes goes down, it doesn't really matter because the data, you've got plenty of, other, you know, it's sitting in front of a load balancer, you've got plenty of other Jenkins masters running. So that's going to be a huge improvement to the architecture of Jenkins and, and a huge improvement to the way that you run it. So the, the last thing we really want to talk about today um, was, was the choices we make in how we, we invest everything for for Jenkins, obviously for the CJP side of the house, um, which Cyril and Cal and Tracy and those guys work on, is much more focused on bottom line. Um, what are the features that are going to go out in the market and help that? And, and for, to a large extent, we're supporting that by making sure Jenkins supports their initiatives, but we also have to make sure that Jenkins is out there and it is the ubiquitous um, across the board. 
Um, and right now, we, we're very persona-driven in how we, we focus on task. And, and James and I, being on the open source side, um, are very much focused on the developer, on the pipeline side, um, and also the development manager, the people that are going to be doing the actual CD work, not the people administering the system, not for the people at the, the business side looking at the, the CD analytics, how, you know, how good are my teams doing? If I compare this team with this team, how are they doing? That's more things that uh, we're focused on from a proprietary side. But for everything that we want to do for developers, that's where we, James and I put our foot down and say, that's open source. That's always going to be open source, and that's where we're going to focus. That, that's not to say that we, we don't, uh, we don't uh, improve features that are great for you know, your project administrators or managers or anything like that. But we just really have, we have to have a, a, a sort of a, a focus point and really, when it comes down to it, there you know there are over one million Jenkins uh, users, developers, um, who are using it every day to deliver um, software. And we think it's really important that we get that developer experience right. Because if we don't get the developer experience right, we don't continue to improve on it. Um, developers will want to use other projects. Um, and I think, like with a lot of these tools, uh, as you probably know, um, it's the adoption is really. Um, uh, driven from the bottom of the organization, it's driven by the engineering staff who are telling their bosses that this is this is a good tool and this is what we want to use. Um, so that that's why we have that focus. Um, maybe you we can have the next slide. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I can. Yeah. So um, what I would like to share with you is actually a page from our internal Confluence wiki, um, of just about how we go about describing the goals and frustrations and motivations of a developer. So um, our a developer's persona, is anyone familiar with persona development or doesn't know what it is? If you don't know what it is, put your hand up. Um, OK. So persona development, the, the very quick uh, answer to what this is, is that when you go out into the market and you talk to, it's a, it's a design and a product technique. Um, when you go out and you have conversations with you know, people in the community, uh, or with customers, you start to get a bit of a feel for what kind of customers or what kind of people um, are touching your product and what kind of touch points they have and what ki kind of goals and frustrations and motivations they have for using that product. And what we try to do is personify this in, in a, a persona document that we can use as a touch point throughout the development of features to say, well, you know, we're looking at an, introducing a new feature. Does this align well with, you know, if we have a goal that we want to improve things to developers, what, what is really on developers' mind, uh, minds? So this is a, a living document. It gets updated as we get new information. Um, and so here is our um, developer persona, uh, Ada, um, named after the first computer programmer, um, Ada Lovelace. Um, and I just would like to describe her to you. Um, you can understand uh, for Ada, um, she's very busy. She, you, you probably recognize this person uh, in you know, the, your colleagues and the people that you work with. It, you know, she's a very busy developer that doesn't like to waste time. Um, she likes something that um, kind of she can get her work done with, gets out of, it, gets out of her way. Um, she's concerned with the quality of her project. You know, she wants to make sure that um, she can deliver the best software as quick as possible so her boss isn't angry at her. Um, and her goals are, you know, sometimes the goals are, n are not business related, right? She, she wants to know, to, you know, she wants to be able to go to lunch and know that when she's, you know, eating, in the middle of eating lunch, that the bill's not going to break and someone's going to send her a Slack message and say, hey, can you get in here and unblock the team? You know, can she go home um, and still be ready to immediately debug um, a, poten a potential busted check-in, like if she needs to do that, uh, you know, does she have the tools to be able to do that? Um, is she able to argue for a raise? Is she able to, t like, say, uh, define herself as somebody of, of value within the organization? Uh, and a bunch of other things. But she also has a bunch of frustrations. So, like, does she hate being called back from lunch to, you know, she hates being called back from lunch to fix a problem. She wants more quality control, but the builds take too long. Um, these are all the sorts of motivations and goals that we think about when we think about Ada, our developer persona. Last slide. That's a broken slide. Oh, what What's a broken slide? Oh, it's a building. Keep. Sorry. Just build it. Oh. Um, so real quick, one of the things that we announced also um, 
this week was the, the Jenkins Enterprise distribution. I know that uh, Harpreet mentioned that, and uh, Brad has talked about that as well. Um, that is something that's, that's coming out of the, the, CG, uh, the CloudB side of the house, but it's very much focused on open source. Um, everything included in there is going to be open source. So this comes back to, to James and I of, of how we um, bring that in in-house to work on the open source plugins that will be certified for that um, to fix bugs in the open source things. Um, and right now we're, we're putting the, you know, anything that's tier one, we are committed to fixing bugs in continuously and releasing that out. Um, we're not going to look at RFEs necessarily right now unless it's one of our plugins, but we are going to look at any kind of major bug to get those fixed and rolled out. So they continue to be certified for that, um, especially for those customers. So that is something that's happening in open source, but it's actually um, delivered through a proprietary mechanism. Yeah. And, and hopefully more and more details will be coming out. Actually, the next talk right after this in this room is all about the assurance program and how that's going to work. Yeah. Um, and that will be delivered mostly by James and myself for, for, for getting all of that work done. Yeah, so if you're in a position where you're sort of scared to upgrade, you use a lot of plugins and you're scared to upgrade your Jenkins server, this is uh, an answer to that problem. So we're going to be, uh, you'll learn, learn about it more if you go to the next session. But, uh, you know, if you uh, upgrade to one, if you're on one version of um, CJP, um, there's a set of versions that are known to, the, to work against uh, that version of CJP. And then when you upgrade, we give you a new set of plugin versions that we've actually tested the upgrade for so that you can upgrade Jenkins reliably and you can trust that that's going to work and then get on with your job. So the last thing um, today is I just wanted to end with a, a kind of a, a call to action that since everyone in this room is obviously a Jenkins user in some way or another, that makes you part of the Jenkins community. Um, and so we want to encourage everyone in here to participate in that community um, by either going to IRC, going to the Jenkins um, user mailing list, go to the Jenkins dev mailing list if you want to talk about plugins or development with that. There's a huge um, knowledge base out there among the community of everything Jenkins, and they're very good at answering questions about that. So if you go on Jenkins IRC and ping somebody and say, hey, I'm having trouble with this, more often than not, you're going to get an answer within like five minutes or something like it's that. It's a 24-7 community, yeah. and that's sometimes a problem when I'm trying to eat breakfast on a Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> and it's also open source, so I mean, feel free to contribute plug, uh, pull requests back into any plugin that you want. Um, uh, most times, the, if the plugin maintainer is available, they'll comment on it and hopefully pull those plugins in. Yeah. But we want to get as many people um, participating back into the Jenkins community as possible um, out there. So if you just go to Jenkins.io, do the drop down on participate, um, all of the ways that you're able to participate are available there. It's a, it's a very welcoming community. It's not the kind of community where you have to ask permission to do things. So don't don't feel afraid if you you know you're going to submit a change and you and you think it might be incorrect. Um, the, the maintainers of the plugin will kind of help you out with that. Um, before we end, is, uh, does anyone have any questions for us? Uh, we'd be happy to answer them. All right. Cool. Yep. All right. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Hope you enjoy the rest of the show for the next night.